Khan. Um, my name is Robert Smale, and I am the current chair of the history department. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Jonathan Sperba, Emeritus Curator's Distinguished Professor and a former chair of the Department of History here at the University of Missouri. Uh, Professor Sperber is the author of nine sole authored monographs. Am I undercounting or I get that right? Nine. 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 Uh, popular Catholicism of the 19th century Germany, Rhineland Radicals, the Democratic Movement and the Revolution of 1848 to 1849. Property and Civil Society in Southwestern Germany, 1820 to 1914. The Kaiser's voters, electors and elections in Imperial Germany. The European Revolution, 1848 to 1851. Revolutionary Europe, 1780 to 1850. Bourgeois Europe, 1850 to 1914. The first edition had a different title. It did, but yes. this one's yeah. better. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Karl Marx, a 19th century life. That one was in 2013. Now, I found that one to have a little bit of a counter-revolutionary <laughs> narrative drift, which I found a little bit funny because in preparation for these marks, I actually found several reviewers who accused the most recent book the Age of Interconnection, A Global History of the Second Half of the 20th Century, accused the book of being slightly Marxist and <laughs> historical materialist in character. Now, I found that very confusing, but then again, this particular critic seemed to be a confused believer in postmodern mumbo jumbo. Um, someone who believes that thought and ideas have some sort of tangible, magical existence outside of the bounds of reality, um, not in any way connected to empirical evidence. Uh, Professor Sperber, on the other hand, takes seriously empirical, physical reality in which uh, the lived human experience occurs. Now, when someone mentions a history of the world in the second half of the 20th century, one might immediately jump to the Cold War, the narratives of the Cold War, the end of the Cold War. Jonathan does get there in chapter six, okay? But before that, you get nature, disease, technologies, markets, migrations. Now, throughout, you get all sorts of wry snippets of Professor Sperber's humor. Um, I was just trying to go through the book for this talk, and um, the one snippet I liked is he was distinguishing between the use of smart bombs in the Gulf War and then the dumb ones. That is actually in there. Uh, you also get small bits of Dr. Sperber's biography here. Like, I learned that you learned how to drive on a Dodge Dart. So there is just so much fun in this book. Now, I will admit, if you see the book, it's quite large that I have not yet finished it. Um, I am right now learning why space travel doesn't work. And he does an excellent job of explaining why that happens. Uh, I have been reading the history department's copy of this book, but I am most definitely going to buy my own copy of the book, and I encourage all of you to do so as well. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Jonathan Sperber. Thank you, Professor Smale, for that very kind introduction and sales pitch at the end, which was the best part. Um, now, all right, so when I started working on this, there really hadn't been a lot written on this sort of broader topic. It was mostly textbooks or works of journalists and pundits. And I'd like to give you a, um, well, slightly satirical version of what they said. This is the way they described the second half of the 20th century. There were crises in Berlin, Cuba, Southeast Asia, Lebanon, Afghanistan. The Cold War arrived and then it went away when a war fell, a wall fell. Computers, lasers, 
genetic engineering, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, rockets and jet aircraft, the internet, a jumble of science and technology characterized the era. Women asserted themselves, and there were lots of demonstrations by altogether different times and different groups. Colonial empires were dismantled, the economy changed, and it had to do with the European Union, oil price shocks, the International Monetary Fund, deregulation and privatization, cell phones, the rise of East Asia, and McDonald's. Um, <laughs> and you know, what we see here, we might call this the Philomena Conk School of Historical Studies, or to put it differently, um, a work of history, which is basically a, a rehash of old newspaper headlines. And this leaves out what historians do, uh, which is that investigating the past, they try devise the main lines of historical development, the important tendencies, their causes. They try and periodize, periodize uh, taking one historical era and comparing it with past and future ones, devising um, these uh, eras within sub-eras. Um, and that's what I'd like to do for you today. And I will do this in um, six areas of interest. I'll do this thematically. I'll talk first about population. I want to talk about the use of natural resources, the economy, society, particularly as it relates to gender, beliefs, and international relations. Now, before I get into my um, actual talk, I wanted to make two um, preliminary remarks. One concerns where we, I get all this information. And the answer is, it is primarily uh, from the divisions and organizations of the United Nations. Some of them you've probably heard of, the World Health Organization or UNESCO. Others are more obscure, the International Telecommunications Union or my personal favorite, the World Tourism Organization. Um, but what they do all do is they take data from individual countries, statistical agencies, they bring it together, they harmonize it, they standardize it, and they present it to the global public, either in publications or increasingly online. Um, so that's a main source. Other sources include other international um, agencies, the OECD, the World Bank, as well as a couple of multinational corporations. Now, the other thing, and this goes directly to Jay Sexton, his talk is he has graciously agreed to let the uh, Kinder Center for American Constitutional Democracy host this talk. And we might want to note, does it have anything to do with the practice of American constitutional democracy? And the answer is yes, it does. Um, but you'll have to wait till we get down to the last two points for that to become particularly clear. All right, so let's start now with population. And we have here on the left panel, uh, the Earth's population from 1950 to 2000. You'll note, of course, about two and a half billion in 1950, six billion uh, 50 years later. The right panel shows the rate of population increase in percentage terms, and you'll note for most of this period um, from the 1950s through the mid-1970s, uh, it's about 2% a year, which is the fastest rate of population growth ever seen in human history. You will note that there's this weird little thing here. This is not a data mistake. This is the result of Mao's psychopathic economic development policy, the so-called Great Leap Forward. At least 30 million people died as a result. Uh, Countless millions more were not born. Um, you know, China's a very large place and it has a large effect on the world. Uh, but period of very rapid population growth. And then starting in the 1970s, we see rates decline quite sharply um, down to almost half of where they'd been at the beginning, but the global population had more than doubled. So the result was that the number of people being added to the human population every year pretty much stayed the same. Uh, now let's take a look at what's behind these movements by looking at natural population trends. And uh, I need to explain here a distinction which is characteristic of UN statistics. Uh, they distinguish between developed or more developed countries on the one hand and less developed countries on the other. More developed countries are Europe, North America, and a few others like Australia, Japan, and Argentina. Less developed are actually most of the world. And so when you look at these figures, you'll always see less developed and the world going along together. And that's because the less developed countries are the world or most of it. Um, so let's start with the, the broadest measure of mortality, which is life expectancy at birth. And what we see here, um, both here in the wealthier countries and here are the poorer ones in the rest of the world, is that there's a fairly rapid 
increase in life expectancy, declines in mortality, um, starting in mid-century and running into the 1980s. The story here is very simple. It's about infectious disease. Uh, the development of antimicrobials and during the Second World War, an immense hothouse of technological progress. The global vaccination campaigns of the World Health Organization resulted in a re remarkable decline in infant childhood mortality, to some extent in adult mortality too. Um, and we should note the prevalence of infectious disease, the three great killers among infectious disease, smallpox, malaria, and tuberculosis, each killed in the first half of the 20th century, more people than died in both world wars. Um, so they're being brought back with an immense uh, change. And you'll also note that life expectancy after the 1980s increases at a much, much slower pace. This is about the resurgence of infectious disease in the late 20th century. The best known example is, of course, HIV AIDS. Uh, but in tropical countries, there's a resurgence of malaria, multiple drug-resistant tuberculosis, um, things like so-called superbugs, methicillin-resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus. The result is that mortality rates in the um, late 20th century only declined by a very modest amount. Now, I'd like to point out for my last point when it comes to demography, what this has meant for particular population groups. And I will emphasize two, youth, people from 15 to 24, and age, those over 60. And when we do this, what we see here, um, these uh, this dark green line is young people. It's a percentage of the population in the world's less developed countries. Uh, the light green line is um, young people in the more developed countries. And as a percentage, what I'd like to point out is when we, we talk about young people, we tend to think of the decade of the 1960s. That was the decade of youth movements, of youth revolution, of youth culture, of youth mu music, of that whole thing. And one of the usual explanations is that there were a lot more young people in the 1960s. Um, this graph does not actually bear this out. In fact, young people as a percentage of the population peak in the 1970s in wealthy countries and in the 1980s in poorer countries. In fact, uh, young people as a percentage of the population are higher at 1950 than they are in the 1960s. Um, so I think what we see actually that clearly is a youth movements and youth rebellion and all that youth stuff in the 60s. It's not so much a demographic trend as it is um, a trend in social policy, in particular the expansion of secondary university education, but also the growth of global um, consumerism, uh, which took the form of consumer electronics, popular music, and fashions. Now, when we look at the elderly, here we see the percentage of the population over 60 in the world's wealthy countries and in the world's poorer countries. Uh, we note there's actually a considerable rise um, up here. Uh, these are percentages never before seen in human history. There are a growing number of old folks around. Um, so what we, we might actually want to say, oh no, one more thing I wanted to say about Oh, never mind. All right, so, uh, so the growing numbers of old folks around. So basically what I would say is that youth is primarily a social and cultural category, age primarily a demographic one. All right, we're going to move on to the next topic, which is human use of natural resources. And as a transition, I just want you to think about something, uh, which we saw in the previous section. Um, the uh, population of the world uh, went from two and a half billion in 1950 to six billion in 2000, and now it's about eight billion. So why aren't we all starving to death? <laughs> There's so many more people here. What are they all eating? And in fact, not only are they eating a lot, increasingly it seems that a characteristic of poverty is that people are obese, they're fat. Um, so it seems like there's a lot of food around, and how does that happen? Um, and here we have, in fact, an answer from uh, UN's, another UN agency, the Food and Agriculture Organization, this are the average grain yields for the world's three major grain crops, wheat, um, rice, and maize or corn. And as you can see, starting at, the figure started in 1961, we can see they've doubled and tripled 
over the last four decades of the 20th century. Um, there's actually a name for this. Uh, it's called the Green Revolution. It refers to the spread of um, hybridized grain crops um, from wealthier countries to others, particularly in Asia. Um, green might lead you to think this is environmentalist, but the original meaning of green was pretty much the opposite of today's meaning. Um, environmentalists generally hated the idea of hybrid crops. They denounced it with a lot of the same rhetoric they use today to denounce GMOs. It's environmentally destructive, it's non-sustainable, um, increases social inequality, and so on. Uh, green was actually, the idea of a green revolution was actually a Cold War phrase. William Goad, director of the U.S. Agency for International Development, making a speech in 1968, said, and I quote, for the last five years, we've had more people starving and hungry, but something has happened. Pakistan is self-sufficient in wheat and rice, and India is moving towards it. It wasn't a red bloody revolution as predicted. It was a green revolution. That's the original meaning of it. And I wanted to provide you with some background in regard to crop yields in a longer term. This is very interesting. These are figures from the USDA. Um, these are average crop, uh, corn yields by decade from the 1870s to the 2000s. And what you notice is that between the 1870s and the 1930s, there's absolutely no change in uh, crop yields for corn in this country. Uh, the amount of acreage um, in corn actually doubles over this period, but there's no increase in agricultural productivity. And this is very much a characteristic feature of the world in the second half of the 19th and the early 20th century. Between 1850 and 1910, it's estimated there are about a billion additional acres put under the plow in the Americas, um, in Manchuria, in Southern Russia. And, and this was a way that um, the growing population of the world was fed um, by the, around this period, basically sort of run out of places to put crops. Um, if you add more, uh, put more land under cultivation, it will involve the destruction of forest land, grasslands, uh, environmentally very destructive. Um, the spread of hybrid hybridization um, has resulted in this astonishing increase in agricultural productivity. Um, this is very much a feature of the era of technological innovations of the, of the um, first half of the 20th century implemented in the second half with remarkable results. So food is a basic, food's a necessity. Um, another thing, of course, that's a necessity is energy. Um, and we have UN figures about this too, um, which are about global energy production. Uh, the United Nations statistics distinguishes four different kinds of energy production. There's the light green here, this is coal. The dark green, which is oil and other petroleum products. The blue, which is natural gas and related. And then the yellow line here, which is what the UN calls non-combustibly generated electricity. That was originally hydropower, but they've added to it nuclear, uh, geothermal, and in very recent years, renewables. Um, now, what we see, oh, oh, one more thing about it, this does not include um, other forms of energy which aren't like traded or uh, statistics gathered on a large scale, things like, I don't know, Indian peasants using dung to heat their stoves or North American homeowners using wood to heat their houses. I mentioned that because I did that between 1985 and 1994. Um, the UN estimates those made up about 20% of the world's total energy production in 1949. Their percentage declines over time. So we've got these four big things. I think what we should note here, of course, is that in 1949, coal is king. The world is coal fi fired. The big change uh, between 1950 and the early 1970s is the very rapid increase in the use of oil. Now, petroleum is used for a number of things today often seem a little weird, like heating houses or generating electricity. Uh, but above all, it was being used to power ever larger numbers of motor vehicles. Something seems to have happened in the 1970s to oil. We'll get to that in a minute. In a minute. Uh, it didn't increase quite so fast. Um, what does happen instead is that natural gas um, moves up and um, by the end of the century, I think it's 1998, has overtaken coal as an energy source. So um, the story really of energy in the second half of the 20th century is frankly a bunch of microorganisms from 100 
million years ago who died and have become our energy. It's entirely fossil fuels. The very modest increases here, and this increases are above all due to nuclear, nuclear, uh, nuclear power. Um, as of 1999, there's essentially zero renewables in the world. Um, it's really all about more and more fossil fuels being burned. And the result of that, um, of course, we can see here is um, yearly average carbon dioxide emissions. And you can see that, of course, they have increased steadily over this period. Um, and um, the result of that is um, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is measured in Mount Loa in Hawaii, um, as you can see, been going up pretty steeply. Down here at this first measurement in 1958, um, it's actually just about CO2 concentrations were just about 5% above pre-industrial levels. So the vast amount of uh, fossil fuel emissions and CO2 um, has come since 1960. Some of you may be familiar with the idea of the Anthropocene, the geological era in which human activity determines the climate and a lot of the shape of the planet. People have debated when the Anthropocene begins. Some people will say the Stone Age, 1500, 1800, 1900. There's a lot of different dates. I personally would say 1960. And I think this chart suggests it. Um, that's when the Anthropocene begins. And the second half of the 20th century is the age of the Anthropocene. We've sort of begun to like talk a little bit about the economy here and we talk about natural resources. So I'm gonna go on to talk about the economy um, and I'm gonna have um, three main features of this section. Uh, one are rates of economic growth. Uh, another is indicators of globalization. And the third will be the development of consumerism in a consumer society in a global context. So let's start with rates of economic growth. Um, the late Angus Madison, the chief economist of the OECD, um, produced this wonderful book in which he has figures on uh, the global product, uh, you might say the world's GDP, uh, as well as the broken down regionally uh, from the year 1 AD to the year 2000, a very impressive set of estimates. Uh, they're best for um, the second half of the 20th century. And this chart shows yearly rates of economic growth in the entire world. Uh, the light green is um, economic growth rates. The darker green is per capita economic growth rates. So growth um, taking into account population growth. And you can't help noticing that in the middle of the 1970s, everything goes down. Um, and growth rates in the second half, the years between um, 1974, 2000 are half of what they were between 1950 and 1973. And not only, not only are these growth rates lower, um, but they really differ regionally. In the first, in the years 1950 to 73, the economy grew very rapidly throughout the world. The region where it grew slowest was in the uh, colonies and then newly independent nations of Africa. But even there, the average GDP uh, percentage increase was 4.4% per year. That's the slowest in the world between 1950 and 1973. Today, if the GDP, GDP would increase at 4.4% a year, people would go, wow, that's great, rapid economic growth. That was in that period the slowest. And in fact, in the second half, in the, between 1975 and 2000, the only part of the world which sees a period of sustained rapid economic growth is in East Asia. Um, first in the so-called Four Tigers, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Uh, and then as we get into the 1980s, this spreads to other parts of East Asia, to Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, and of course the big one is China. Um, and so really we go from a world of very rapid economic growth until yeah, 1974, suddenly everything turns around much slower and um, only a few places are privileged to have rapid economic growth. You know, I keep talking about the mid 1970s and uh, uh, those of us of a certain age will remember what happened then. And I can happily show you what happened then. Um, this is from our friends at British Petroleum, uh, which has a wonderful yearly report on global energy markets. And, um, horrible company responsible for one of the worst 
uh, environmental disasters of recent years. And in its original name, the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, from one of the most disastrous Cold War interventions, whose awful results are still around today. Um, but they did provide a useful graph of energy prices. Um, <laughs> The, um, the bright green line is um, oil prices adjusted for inflation. The dark green line is oil prices in um, current dollars. And what you can see is that from the, um, really from the 1880s to the 1960s, it doesn't change very much. There's a remarkable stability in oil prices. And of course, in the famous oil price shocks of the 1970s, prices jump up. And they've gone up and down since then, but they've been at a much higher level. And what we can say is that uh, that's not the entire reason for the slowdown in global economic growth, but it's an important one. Energy has gotten much, much more expensive. Uh, one of the potential benefits, I'd say, of the increasing use of renewables is there's the possibility that energy will be cheap again, uh, which would be a really good thing. All right. Um, another element of the global economy um, is the way that goods, people, and capital cross the borders of individual states, continents, and oceans, what we generally refer to as globalization. Here's one measure of globalization. This comes from the researches of the economist Maurice Upsfeld, um, which measures um, foreign investment worldwide. And you sort of can't help noticing that in the years between 1960 and 2000, there's been a lot of foreign investment. <laughs> now, I gotta admit, this graph, which I, I deliberately use for effect, is actually sort of cheating because it's foreign investment not adjusted for inflation and not adjusted um, for as a percentage of GDP. But even if you do that, um, foreign investment, border crossing investment increases nine times between 1960 and 2000. So the idea of the world as an age of, this period as an age of globalization um, seems very particularly correct. Um, the other point I want to make concerns consumerism and consumer society. <laughs> there are a lot of different ways you can talk about consumer society. Um, there's a plethora. I'm just going to concentrate on one very simple one here, which is um, the purchase of consumer durables. And I will talk in particular about the two big consumer durables of the second half of the 20th century, uh, which are automobiles and televisions. These are the prime consumer durables of the era. What we would actually like to know is what percentage of households owned one of those um, in different countries. Unfortunately, those statistics are largely not available with a few exceptions. So I've used a simple proxy measure, the point at which we reach um, a figure of 250 of these particular consumer durables per thousand population. That's a point at which at least half and more than half of households will have one. They're really gonna have a big impact. So we'll start with automobiles. Before 1950, uh, no country in the world had reached that point. Um, the closest was the United States at 200, 25 automobiles per thousand inhabitants in 1941. And when we see uh, crossing the threshold of automobilization, I've given you uh, the years in which this happens. And what you see actually is the first countries are the former settler colonies of the British Empire, affluent and uh, not very densely populated. It's not surprising cars get there first. Uh, the 1960s, mostly in the 1970s, is the period of the automobilization of Western Europe. And then the truth is after the, that, this automobilization largely comes to an end. Um, there's some catching up going on in um, Southern and um, Eastern Europe. And there's a couple of countries which are very late in getting to automobilization, Japan and Kuwait. Uh, Saudi Arabia would probably be there as well, but their statistics on this thing are unreliable. It's basically all Saudi statistics. You never know what's going on in that country. Um, and and um, that's it. That's the only countries that have, have crossed that threshold. Um, but this was not expected. Um, and I want to give you a wonderful example, which is this, the Stanford anthropologist, James Ferguson. 
um, who spent his life studying the miners of Zambia's copper belt. When he started in 1970, he was talking, they were all saying, we're going to be buying a car like next year. It's really coming. Um, and when he, 1990s, um, what happened actually was copper prices it fell, production had been mechanized, and the government was sending them all back to their native villages where their family and relatives were threatening to kill them. Um, so the, the, the promise, the spread um, of this particular consumer durable outside the world's wealthy countries never actually happens. I think that's related to that decline in economic growth rates that we saw um, happening after, 19, after the mid-1970s. Um, in um, 2000, um, there's only a few countries besides these that are getting close, between 190 and 240 cars per thousand. They're all in Asia, uh, Israel, South Korea, Taiwan, and Malaysia. The rest of the world, no. Um, Nigeria, the largest African country, it's four automobiles per thousand people. India and China, the world's two largest countries, with over 35, 40% of the world's population. It's six and seven cars per thousand inhabitants. Even if you took the sort of 10% of the population in India and China, circa 2000, which um, com uh, pundits and journalists would call middle class, a phrase which I interpret as meaning aspiring to Western levels of consumerism and imagine them as their own country. Um, it's uh, automobile ownership rates would only be 60 or 70 per thousand, about the same place as Turkey. Um, so automobiles have remained in a relatively limited space in the second half of the 20th century. That particular form of the ultimate consumer durable, I think, uh, the one that everybody wanted, um, remained. Uh, relatively limited phenomenon. Now, when we move on to TV, um, we see a similar sort of pattern to start. Um, the US, the former settler colonies, uh, Western Europe, um, 60s and 70s, but no, and very much unlike uh, with cars, Eastern Bloc countries, communist countries could never get it together to build cars for people, even, um, at, but they could build TVs, and they did. Um, and they built a lot of TVs. Um, and um, notice, though, that um, actually that in the 1980s and 1990s, we find TVs reaching um, Asia, South America, um, being much more globally better distributed than, um, than cars. Um, and um, the International Telecommunications Union does have some figures on the percentage of households that own televisions of uh, around 2015. And what they show is that um, in Europe, the Americas, North and South, East Asia, about 90% or more of households have a TV in most of these countries. In South Asian countries, India and Indonesia, it's uh, 50%. Uh, the only African countries uh, where it's over half the population are South Africa and Gambia. I have no idea why there are so many TVs in Gambia. But, um, and um, I, I mean, yeah, by the way, I, I did forget to mention this discussion about decline birth rates. Um, the countries uh, where large proportions of the population own TVs are also countries where the birth rate is at or below natural fertility replacement levels. Um, there is actually, I mean, demographers actually have a thing, they call the theory of alternative entertainments, but um, <laughs> um, I don't know if it's true, um, but I will say that, um, I'm sorry, I did forget to talk about fertility. I'm so excited about um, life expectancy. <laughs> but but what, I, what I can say is that um, there's probably a connection, not a direct connection, um, but in the sense that there's part of broader social change, which produces both um, television ownership and contraception. Um, so now we're going to move on. We're going to move on here to society and gender. Um, <coughs> I want to talk particularly, there are three aspects, of, particularly of women's lives, although as we'll see men's lives become involved as well, which fit this pattern as well. Um, and these are statistics from the International Labor Organization about the proportion of women of primary productive age, 25 to 29, who are in the labor force, who are taking gained occupations 
Um, the darker green line here are the, um, the world's less developed countries and the proportion of women doesn't change a lot. And of course, given the prevalence of what economists call the informal economy, um, peasant agriculture, market stalls and the like, it's sort of difficult in those countries to figure out exactly what it means to be involved in the, um, the economy anyway. Uh, what we see in uh, the world's wealthier countries, actually very interesting, um, not a lot of change between 1950 and 1960. All the increase is entirely attributable to the communist countries in Eastern Europe. Um, in the rest of the world's uh, wealthy countries, not only was there no change, but in a number of them, in Denmark, Iceland, Norway, Ireland, Portugal, the Netherlands, and New Zealand, the proportion of women 25 to 29 in the labor force actually declined between 1950 and 1960. Uh, they were busy reproducing. Um, there's a change, a particularly sharp change after 1970, uh, where we see the proportion of women's reproductive age in the labor force reaching very hard levels, um, three quarters. Um, and this is really, I think, a fundamental change, the idea that reproduction and um, paid employment are not incompatible. Um, it represents a fundamental change in ideals of gender in women's lives and a whole bunch of things. Um, the second point I want to make concerns education. Uh, this is a rather complex statistic. Um, it's the number of women university graduates age 25 and over per 100 men university graduates age 25 and over. This statistic encompasses the entire adult population, which means it's encompassing a long history of university education. And I've got them um, for countries literally around the world here, um, Bulgaria and Italy and Europe, Ecuador and South America, India, Korea, Pakistan in Asia and the United States and North America and Zambia and Africa. And what we see here is that in some countries in the um, 1950s, 60s and 70s, uh, this ratio declines. There were fewer women going to college compared to men. This is true of both Bulgaria and the United States. Um, following the 1970s, there's a very rapid rise in women's university education to the point where in a number of countries uh, in the US, Italy, Ecuador, and Bulgaria, um, there's a greater proportion of women in the adult population who are university graduates than men. Uh, and the proportion of women who are university graduates is going up steadily everywhere. Um, in 1985, according to the statistics of UNESCO, uh, men made up a majority of university students in 84 countries, women in 23. In the 2010-11 academic year, once again, according to UNESCO, um, men were a majority of university students in 23, women in 79. And I really can't, can't underestimate what a large change this is. Since universities were invented about eight or 900 years ago, they've always been guy things. They've really been like spaces of, of, of men and masculinity and, and the whole thing. And starting in the 1980s, this is completely and totally reversed. Really a remarkable change in an important human institution. Um, the final point I have is about the decline of marriage as a site of family life. It's about the percentage of births that are illegitimate. Um, it's very difficult to find these statistics, but I did come up with five very different countries, um, and they all show the same story. Um, more and more births are out of wedlock. Um, some cases in Chile, um, two thirds. Now, there's a number of reasons for this. Um, in the Scandinavian countries, or Sweden here is an example, uh, there's a strong cultural preference uh, for living together without getting married or only getting married after you've been cohabiting for several decades rather than as often the case in other places, uh, getting married and then cohabiting or starting to cohabit and then getting married. But it's also clear uh, that there are growing numbers of women who are just simply having children without partners. And the question is, why is this happening? Um, and it's happening really around the world. Um, it's very difficult to get these statistics, but every, every ones I've seen for other individual countries show the same trend. Um, I think it's largely because as a result of the uh, very profound social and economic changes, which have characterized the last third of the century, there's a 
noticeably declining proportion of adult men who can support a family. Um, and that's become a reason not to uh, get married. Um, and I'll give you actually an example of a country which is an exception, which proves the rule. And that country is Japan, an island realm which goes its own way and is generally different from the rest of the world. Um, in Japan, 1950s gender ideals um, of the married couple where the man works and supports the family and the wife stays home, has children, and takes care of the household remain very strong into the 21st century. Um, it's a country where the illegitimacy rate has gone from 1% in the 1970s to 2% in the 2000s. Japan is also a country where as a result of the economic changes, uh, an ever-growing proportion of its population has irregular, unsteady employment, um, at least 30% of the labor force in the early 21st century. Um, and what you've seen happening in Japan is that Japanese women have simply been refusing to marry or even have sexual relations with men who can't, um, who can't afford it and can't support them. And there's developed a whole class of rejected men in Japan known as the hikimori, um, about a million of them in 2010, who just stay in their room all day and um, satisfy their romantic and sexual urges with manja and anime characters rather than actual female human beings. Um, and I think this very bizarre story from Japan is suggestive of another profound transformation in, in human society. Um, we can see in the relationship between marriage and economic capacity. Uh, it is an example of what I think is a global crisis of masculinity, um, a phrase which has been used a lot and probably overused, but I think uh, these statistics suggest there's something to it. Now, um, so this, this business about a crisis in masculinity um, brings me to um, the fifth point of my talk, which is about beliefs, which is about ideals and aspirations. I'm just going to talk about one. I, my book goes into a number of others, uh, but this one is an interesting one. It's the idea of progress. Um, the idea of progress um, has its origins in the Enlightenment, the great 18th century European intellectual movement. Um, and I think we might just sort of informally define it as the idea that human history, or at least parts of human history, um, see a broad forward movement characterized by a growing scientific understanding of the natural world, a growing technological mastery of the natural world as a result of this understanding, um, improved standards of living and life as a result of this technology, and also improved forms of social and political organization, and even of human morality, all as a result of a greater understanding of the natural world, scientific understanding of the natural world. Um, the 19th century's great century for progress it spreads, becomes ever more common. Um, it, it gets involved. It's, seen as part of Darwin's theory of natural selection, or that's actually an extreme misunderstanding of what Darwin was doing, but it's very commonly seen like that. And in a very interesting development in the late 19th and early 20th century, this idea of progress begins to spread very rapidly among intellectuals outside of Europe, um, in colonized or imperialized countries, including India, China, Turkey, and um, Persia, Iran, intellectuals begin to say, it's not just the European culture that is a culture of progress. Our culture is too, or at least it used to be. We've gotten off track and we need to get back onto the track of progress. And in spite of two world wars, um, in the post-war, which you might think might um, certainly a lot of technological progress, but the idea that you have better morality or better forms of government, you might wonder about that. But in the 50s and 60s, the idea of progress is everywhere in the world, literally everywhere in the world. I'm just going to give you three examples to make the point. One comes from the Western capitalist world. Some of you of a certain age will remember the slogan of the General Electric Corporation, then one of the world's great industrial companies. Progress is our most important product. That, however, is just an abbreviated version of the full slogan, which I will read to you. In engineering, in research, in manufacturing skill, in the values that bring a better, more satisfying life, at General Electric, progress is our most important product. That really is the definition of the idea of progress. 
It was read out over the air, a TV program sponsored by GE, uh, by a Hollywood B-movie actor with political aspirations, Ronald Reagan, who actually is, is a person who deeply, deeply believes in progress, even after the rest of the country had given up on it. Um, in the communist world, the communists felt progress was theirs. They were progressive. Uh, there was the progress publishers in Moscow, which brought out the works of Marx and Engels in English, um, progress textile work, textile works in East Berlin, all the communists were for progress. But we should note that the uh, people of the so-called non-aligned, the third world, the um, countries uh, demanding independence from imperialism, they too were powerful believers in progress. If you read anti-imperialist classics like Jawaharlal Nehru's The Discovery of India or Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, you will find their authors profoundly believed in progress, condemned imperialism for making progress impossible colonized countries and envisaged a post-imperialist future that would be a realm of progress. A better example, even better example comes from Kwame Nkrumah, anti-Pan-Africanist and anti-imperialist hero, president of Ghana, the first sub-Saharan African country to be liberated from British imperialist rule. This is what he told the Council on Foreign Relations in 1958, and I quote, the hopes and ambitions of African people have been planted and brought to maturity by the impact of Western civilization. We cannot tell our people that material benefits and growth and modern progress are not for them. If we do, they will throw us out and seek other leaders who promise more. Therefore, we have no choice. Africa has no choice. We have to modernize. Everybody, both sides of the Cold War, everyone believes in progress. Um, and then something happens to progress in the 1970s, um, which is, doesn't seem quite so good anymore. Uh, first, it's, it, to the extent it's related to things like economic growth, um, increasing consumerism, there's a big problem with that because we see there's a big decline in economic growth. Um, growing technology seems to bring mostly environmental destruction and not um, growing material benefits. A lot of technologies, which in the 50s were seen as embodying progress, promising a better future, um, space flight, uh, nuclear energy, uh, computers in particular, turn out either to be big failures or um, sort of prosaic and annoying rather than progress. And it would be fair to say that by the late 20th century, progress seems to have come to an end. And to believe in progress is um, to be sort of naive, I think, today. Um, now, since this is all about graphs and charts and maps, let me show you how we can, we can show this um, actually graphically. Um, and this is, um, this is from another multinational corporation uh, providing a source which I think uh, intellectual and cultural historians have not made enough use of is Google and their n-grams. What an n-gram is, is it gives you the frequency with which any given word appears in the corpus of text that Google has digitized. And of course, Google has digitized a lot of texts. Um, so I chose, uh, so I did this, I found out the engram for progress, not just in English, but in three global languages, English, Spanish, and French, in the main European language spoken on both sides of the Cold War divide, German, and in the two languages of the, two main languages of the communist world, Russian and simplified character Chinese. And when we plot the frequency, <laughs> this is what we find. In all these different languages, progress seems to peak somewhere in the 1960s and 1970s, and I should add, actually, it's a 20th century high point, and it's basically downhill from there. Um, progress is beginning to vanish from our uh, vocabulary. The one exception in light blue here is uh, China. Um, you'll note that in the 1960s, progress seems unpopular in China. Uh, the Great Leap Forward, after all, was an attempt at progress when it didn't work very well. Um, but since then, China's been leading the world in progress. China is a very large but lonely exception, um, in, at least officially. And it's hard to know in China because, of course, anything that's published in China requires government approval. So it's hard to know the extent to which um, Chinese believe in it, although if you think what's happened in China over the last 40 years, you might want to believe in it too. But in the rest of the world, no one believes in progress. Um, now this is a, now here, here's one of my Kinder Institute moments for you. Um, <laughs> because you know, um, there's actually a very common thing in public opinion polls in this country. They ask, is the country on the right track or the wrong track? 
And, you know, and so when you have a large proportion of the population who says the country is on the wrong track, the pundits all say, oh, oh the party in power is going to get its ass handed to it at the next elections. And sometimes this happens, but often it doesn't. And um, this is because, as we'll see, the country, America is always on the wrong track. Um, I, uh, no, really, really the, 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 uh, the longest uh, series, data series I could find is from the Gallup organization. Um, they have a slightly different way to put it. Um, they ask, um, are you satisfied with the way things are going in America? Um, and this is 19, um, 1979 to the um, 2017 or something like that. These are the percentages of the population who are satisfied. And you'll know a majority is satisfied only a few short years in the mid 1980s when that progress guy was president. And then again, around 2000. <laughs> For most of this period, and we are talking here now 45 years almost, Americans think the country's on the wrong track. Um, and I think what we see here is that this is another way of saying Americans no longer believe in progress. They no longer think the future will be one of improvement. Um, and I think this makes the country's politics fundamentally different uh, because for a long time, Americans really did believe in progress. All right. Now, um, talking about this brings me to my final point. Um, which is about international relations in this period. And, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff that determined international relations, which occurred on a remarkably global scale in the second half of the 20th century. Um, but the thing that probably did it more than anything else was the Cold War, uh, the clash between um, the Western powers led by the United States and the Eastern Bloc led by the Soviet Union. Um, now, insofar as it was a conflict, um, really, the outcome was never in doubt. Um, the Western powers had a decisive military superiority when it came to um, air power and naval power. Um, now, it's true that it's some places, Soviet Union, they had a lot more tanks in Central Europe and infantry, although as we've seen in the war with Ukraine, it's not clear how really, how really impressive that was. Um, but in a more important way, so Western powers had a decisive advantage because they could produce they had the assets, the affluence to produce an enormous array of advanced weaponry while at the same time producing all those consumer durables people wanted and making not just um, lots of TVs and cars, but the coolest, the coolest products, the best movies and TVs, the best music, the coolest fashions. Uh, the, communist, the communist regime simply could not do that. Um, and th in that respect, the conflict was never really in doubt. Uh, the outcome was never really in doubt. Um, and yet, yet, yet there are moments of doubt, fear, and panic uh, among the Western powers of the early 1950s, perhaps again in the early 1960s, and again at the beginning of the 80s, when there's widespread fear that the West is losing the Cold War, that the communists are on, the, on march. Um, there are a number of explanations for this. Um, the, the very esteemed um, diplomatic historian, Frederick Lojeval, has argued that it's entirely domestic politics. The out political party wants to make use of the idea that the um, United States is losing the Cold War as a way of winning elections, condemning the, the, the ruling political party for that. Um, and there's certainly a lot of that going on. And this, of course, is once again, is part of the practice of American constitutional democracy. But I don't think it's the entire story. And to show that, I'd like to have us look at a couple of maps that I've had drawn up. Um, and this one shows the extent of communist regimes in 1945 at the end of the Second World War. Of course, there's the USSR, and then there's Mongolia here, which is also there's two. Um, now, just five years later, um, communism has taken over the, almost the entire Eurasian landmass. Um, remarkable advance in the space of five years. Um, a third of humanities, the communists like to say around 1950, were now communists. This seemed like a very rapid and extremely disquieting um, state of affairs. And I think it's the background to a lot of the stuff we associate with the age of the high Cold War and McCarthyism, all this stuff in American politics. But what I think we also need to realize is there is a second period of advance of communism. And we can see that if we look at the map in 1980. Um, and here we see that communism has extended into South Asia, and here's Vietnam, Afghanistan, number of African countries as well. And even more importantly, um, among the world's so-called non-aligned countries, um, there's a growing trend, um, which was propounded very large, very 
powerfully by the government of Cuba to say that non-aligned countries should really uh, see the Soviet Union as their natural ally. So we might say these are the aligned non-aligned. Um, the pro-Soviet non-aligned, there's a lot of them. You can see they're, they're all over <coughs> Africa and the Middle East. Um, and what we might say is if we look at the world in 1980, <coughs> it would seem like the Soviet Union was on the advance. Um, this is the background, this is of course, the background to the rise of Ronald Reagan, uh, the so-called New Cold War of the 1980s. But there's, um, there's another point I'd like to make about that, because there's a prominent figure on the world stage right now, because he's just the exact same age I am, uh, reached adulthood in the decade of the 1970s. Um, and that's, of course, Vladimir Putin. Um, reached adulthood, joined the KGB. And when Putin thinks about the world, he sees the normal world as a world in which Russia is on the advance, is aggressive, the United States is on the defensive, the Russians are aggressively pushing forward, they're expanding their influence uh, all across the world. Um, that's the normal state of affairs. And Putin clearly believes that somehow there's been some trick, some imperialist aggression, some some dastardly thing that the Americans have done to change that. I and mean, he's determined to return to what he regards as the normal state of affairs, which is the 1980s. But I have to say that both right-wing American politicians and people like Vladimir Putin were fundamentally um, incorrect about this because these countries, which were the Soviet Union's purported allies, let me write to you what a Russian publicist, one Dmitry Folksy, who was an ally of Mikhail Gorbachev, said about these countries in the late 1980s. It happened more than once that some African or Asian state turned out to be completely different from the way many of our press organs depicted it. After the regime had fallen, did it become known that national patriotic forces on coming to power had behaved like feudal or even pre-feudal princes the country after embarking on the path of progressive transformations and strengthening national independence had arrived at an economic catastrophe and that its tired and indignant people had finally lost patience and overthrown their rulers. Um, and so this, this second global advance of communism was not what we might expect it to have been. And of course, we see in 1990 uh, communist regimes uh, coming to an end at a very rapid pace. And then in 2000, it's basically just Cuba and North Korea. Um, and so that, that seems to be how I, I, I would uh, see the history of the Cold War. All right. Uh, so the hour is almost up. And I'm not going to keep you much longer. I'm just going to provide you with two conclusions. Um, one concerns the nature of the era. And I'm going to do something mathematical here. I'm going to talk about the exponential function y equals e to the x. Um, this is a fu mathematical function which is characterized by the fact that it's always increasing and its rate of increase is always increasing. It's used in the natural and physical sciences to model pro uh, processes of very rapid growth. Um, it has a very distinct feature which is that for a long time nothing seems to be happening. It seems to be just basically horizontal and then there's a very quick change and it's moving closer and closer to vertical. Um, an example of that that we've, we've all seen in the past few years have been COVID cases, uh, COVID deaths, which have followed an exponential curve. Um, and I would suggest that the second half of the 20th century is an age of exponentials. It is a period in which either long-term processes have reached the point where it's getting into the more vertical phase, uh, or that these actually exponential increases start in the second half of the 20th century. Let me provide you with a few examples. This is a graphic that shows the human population from 10,000 BC until basically well, 2018. And you can't help noticing, right, that we're uh, 20th, second half of the 20th century is the vertical part of population growth. Um, to take another example, uh, these are very approximate figures on um, international trade as a percentage of the world's GDP. Start 1500 to um, uh, second decade of the 20th century. Um, these were all very approximate. We notice that the the, um, the vertical phase seems to be beginning around 1900. Then, of course, we have the age of total war, which 
um, totally blows up the world economy and disrupts international trade. And then in the second half of the century, once again, we see that enormous <coughs> rapid, almost vertical phase of the exponential curve. Um, another example, greenhouse gas emissions from 1750 to 2020. Once again, the second half of the 20th century is the phase in which um, the curve goes, the exponential curve makes that rounding and then starts to increase at a very, very rapid pace going vertical. Um, one more example, since we're talking about emissions of toxic gases, is cigarette production in the 20th century. And once again, the second half of the century is the phase in which cigarette production does in fact go vertical. And in the years between 1950 and 2000, in the world's wealthier countries, one man in five died as a consequence of cigarette smoking. Um, so we can see that. Um, we, <coughs> we can also see examples of um, exponential growth um, which got interrupted. Here we see oil, uh, you saw this graph earlier, this is oil, oil output between 1949 and 1970s, which is increasing at an exponential rate, and then it sort of slows down some. Another example of exponential growth in the second half of the 20th century, this is from our friends at the World Tourism Organization, the number of international tourist arrivals. Um, which show that same pattern of exponential, of exponential growth um, entirely in the second half of the century. Um, and the most recent example, and this comes from the uh, World Bank's uh, economic development indicators, is the proportion of the population in the world with access to the internet. Um, starting in 1990, right? You no, know, very slow, of course. Uh, once again, an X example of exponential growth. And I would say this is a broader feature of the period. The way I would put it is that um, starting around 1880 or so, um, you see the development of altogether new forms of uh, technology-based industrial production. Um, historians often talk about the second industrial revolution, um, manufacture of steel on a large scale basis, the products of the chemical and the um, electrical industries. Um, they get going in this period, or uh, they get a big um, shot in the arm from total war, especially the Second World War, which is an immense hothouse of technological progress. And just to name a few of the things that we, uh, technologies that develop in the Second World War, these include jet aircraft, rockets, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, antibiotics, and uh, solid state circuits. Uh, so this is this gigantic surge, uh, which has the potential for this very rapid growth. Uh, and then after 1945, we find the social and economic institutions put in place that make it possible, um, which they weren't there during the age of total war. And that produces that rapid upward curve. Now, in mathematics, um, the exponential curve goes on getting increasing more rapidly and faster and faster, getting closer and closer uh, to vertical, to, if I may quote Buzz Lightyear, to infinity and beyond. <laughs> um, in a finite world of finite natural resources, of finite human information spans, this simply can't continue. And um, I would say actually one of the big political questions in the contemporary world, taking politics in the broadest sense possible, are those people who envisage the age of uh, exponentials going on indefinitely, and those who are thinking about a post-exponential future. Um, if we asked, does the age of exponentials have an end in the second half of the 20th century? Then I would say probably the 1970s, the age of the oil price shock, the decline of global population increase in the beginning of the worldwide practice of birth control, um, that's perhaps the time. Now, I'll admit this is a sort of Eurocentric definition. I'm not sure people in East Asia would agree with that. But it does suggest a way that we can also periodize the second half of the 20th century. And this is my very final point that I'm going to do today. Um, we have a post-war era between 1945 and 19 early to mid 1960s, in which all the elements for this exponential increase that had developed in the age of total war and in the earlier period of the second industrial revolution come to pass. And not just that, in which um, important global 
confrontations, um, the Cold War, um, the liberation, the end of European empires, these are all things very heavily determined by the age of total war. This is the age, the consequences, the post-war era, it's the post-war, the total age of total war is very important. We go on to a period of upheaval in the 1960s and 1970s, when all these structures developed in the age of total war and um, implemented in the post-war era's collapse. Um, and we end, uh, of course, in an age when the only rapid economic growth in the world is in East Asia. In, um, what my editor at Oxford University Press insisted I call the late millennium era. Thank you, Tim Bent. Um, it's in the book all the time. Um, 1980 to 2001, I shall call the origins of our current condition. Um, and that is, that, is, that is how I would describe the second half of the 20th century as an age of exponentials broken up um, in part determined by its relationship to the previous era of total war and broken up into these three periods. And with that, having gone on for an hour, it's time I stop. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Yeah, relevant. yeah. No, no, absolutely. There, there's a whole, I mean, it, this is actually part of the, the growth and prosperity you can have what they sometimes call the fourth age, um, you know, which I think you can like have a post labor force part of your life in which you're not just like some old person in an old age home sitting and waiting for death. But you can like, you know, you know, and people my age, it's not long ago, people my age were in old age homes and not standing here in 410 giving lectures. Um, and, and, and so I, th I think that is, you're absolutely right about that. But what's interesting is you've got so many of these, in, in wealthy countries, of course, not not, not in Africa, you've got so many of, of, of these people. Um, I'll just add, Merve, I hope you've seen your, your own hand your own influence on some of the things here because I, I've learned a lot from talking to you about some of these issues. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about how the structure of the book came to you because I, I love how the the form of the book mirrors the themes of inter, interconnectedness mm -hmm. and it seems the right way to tell it. And I'm wondering if you were ever tempted to tell the story chronologically. No. Um, uh, <laughs> actually, um, I, I will uh, I will talk about say about my inspiration. There's a German historian a man named Jürgen Osterhammel who wrote this absolutely fantastic global history of the 19th century, Die Verwandlung der Welt. It's now available in an English translation. It's the transformation of the world. Um, it's very long, it's like 1,400 pages. It's this enormous book, but he does such a great job of developing a thematic version of the 19th century that I originally actually was going to stick very closely to Uster Hummel's model. But as I began working on it, I realized I wanted to change it and break up the book into these different sections. Um, I got these, these weird names. Oh, what is it? In, um, the natural world interactions, varieties of the social and um, dreams and nightmares um, as these sort of broad encompassing categories for different, um, different thematic approaches. Um, yeah. I. Now, if, if I were going to write a, a history of the world in the age of total war, um, which I'm not, um, but if I were, <laughs> I might be more tempted to do a more narrative approach because, you know, it's really broken up by these, uh, these two enormous world wars, which change everything. Um, the second half of the 20th century doesn't work like that. And so I was, it really didn't seem to me that a narrative approach would be as helpful. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Uh, your yes. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for this very fascinating talk. Uh, I was wondering when you got all these uh, examples, mm -hmm. and coming back to the Marxist point of view, I mean, what are the driving forces for you? Uh, isn't the American empire something 
you would consider as the major driving force in the 20th century, and that doesn't appear at all. No. Uh, so oh, I haven't read your book yet, yeah. but we're all <laughs> there. And, and so I'm, I'm just curious to learn. And, and each example you gave, I mean, you have written on each country in one monograph, basically. Yeah, yeah. Right? And Japan is such a great example. And you have you have the globalization, <laughs> but still they have a different way of setting up national history yeah. and all of that. So how did you? How did you? Yeah. Good that is a good question. Yeah. Um, actually, you know, when I talk about the Cold War, the confrontation between the Western powers and the Eastern Bloc, you know, if you want to call the Western powers the American Empire and its allies, I'm fine with that. Um, but I, I would say that the two main thematic ideas of the book are, on the one hand, um, this idea of the impact of the age of total war. I really think the age of total war like, immensely determines um, the second half of the 20th century. You know, it's obviously most strongly after the two decades after 1945, but the example, is, uh, the example I like to use, um, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, is um, German unification in 1990, the two plus four talks. The two plus four talks were a peace conference to end the Second World War, in which all the participants denied that was what they were doing. Um, and so, you know, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, unification of the two German states, that the Cold War and the Second World War ended at the same time. Um, the other thing, of course, is this exponential stuff. And I guess that sort of I do become something of a technological determinist, determinist here. Um, and I think that plays a large role both in creating this, but also in creating disappointments because the technology doesn't yield the great aspirations people have. You know, in, um, Oh, in the 1950s, the guy who was the head of the Kirchhoff Institute in the USSR, which is their uh, Atomic Energy Research Institute, he said, well, nuclear power will make um, Siberia's climate just like that of Crimea, will make it subtropical. So, you know, uh, of course, the head of the US Atomic Energy Com uh, Commission said nuclear power would be too cheap to meter. There are these, these wonderful police there. <coughs> and of course, there's the, the, the immense disillusion plays a large role. So I would say those are the two big things. And yes, I am a technological determinist, at least in this book, anyway. <laughs> yes. Professor, do these studies suggest to you the uh, challenges for policy buyers in the future? And what, and what, what challenges exist and what might be an appropriate response to those challenges? Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, as in, in the immortal words of Yogi Berra, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> and um, I, I'm not, I'm not sure I want to do that. But I mean, the one, the one I want. This, I'm, I'm far to say there's really nothing really very. Um, there's nothing very original about this, uh, but it does concern the fact that as a, you know, since 19 because of the, the emission of greenhouse gases since 1960 has created a state of affairs which really. Um, uh, cast serious doubt on the future of human civilization and the need to do something about this on a global basis is probably the single most important task of our day. Um, I, I'd have to write a global history of the second half of the 20th century to say that. But what I can say is that there was at the time that the greenhouse gas issue came to public consciousness in the 1980s and 1990s, there was another one, um, very similar issue um, the growing amount of chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere, which destroyed the ozone layer. Um, another very common, new kind of um, human emissions, creating new kinds of threats to the environment. Actually, in the 1990s, most people couldn't tell them apart. Um, public opinion polls literally found people didn't understand the difference. But the chlorofluorocarbon issue was resolved by international agreements. It was really astonishing. It was resolved by international agreement. They were banned. Basically, the wealthy countries started, the poorer countries joined. Um, there was compensation and technology transfer. And the, the hole in the ozone layer is actually beginning to close. We actually could resolve that problem. There's no reason looking at that that we couldn't resolve the CO2 issue as well. Um, so I guess that's what I would say. That's what I would say is like, to my mind, the single most important policy issue, probably more than any others. Not, there aren't a lot of others. Chris, uh, as always, Dr. Sperber, excellent to make graphs sing in a way that <laughs> This is a very US central question, but I can't help but ask about crime and, uh, crime and incarceration. No, 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 no. Actually, that's a good question. Um, and there, there's, you know, it's a very big book, and I just gave you a few basically selections from it. Um, 
I do talk about transformations in global social structure. Um, and this relates to the creation of a social group, um, which is largely excluded from the economy, ordinary ways of earning a living. And, uh, this is where we find sort of, a, sort of like this weird backdoor globalization of crime, um, global networks of crime, and the, uh, the transport, particularly the drugs and women across international borders. Um, I guess drugs, weapon, women, and weapons um, that, are, that, that, that fit this um, as well. So, you know, I, I do actually talk about that. And thank you for your very kind comments about the graph. And I got to say, this is just Microsoft Excel. <laughs> <laughs> God, I'm an awful program. Um, um, so uh, the fact that I can do that, maybe uh, shows there's hope for humanity. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Jonathan, I just would be great, you know, uh, amazing. As always, uh, I'm cons I wonder if you would, you know, the exponentials part yeah. concerns me because it strikes me as uh, maybe a little bit of secular apocalypticism. <laughs> you know, and, and, and uh, what concerns me about it is this, as is this timeline, this post 1950 timeline for all of it. You know, which also coincides with the age of the age of collecting international statistics. Okay. It seems like any time. But as you say, you know, the ozone layer is a good example, and there are a number of these things. Oh, yeah. There are certain things that, like, you know, if you remember how polluted, like the visible pollution, right? Me a TED Talk circuit too. Um, as for this, ex, I mean, you know, for obvious reasons, of uh, exponential increases in my bank account would be important. Um, the, um, uh, you know, I, I, what I'd say about that is, um, you know, um, we do have some long-term estimates, um, and that those 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 statistics about economic growth I gave, and the late Angus Madison, and he's actually devised these from like. The year one AD, they're they're um, they're 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 obviously very crude approximations, but um, they always show the same thing. You know, they show that that exponential, they show that that growth, and of course it can't. You know, and, and you're right. Um, other examples have not gone on like that, and it's a good thing too. If uh, chlorofluorocarbons had been um, used at an increasingly exponential rate, we really would be uh, we'd have serious problems now. So, and you're absolutely right. But this is in part about human agency. Um, talks like this with these graphs um, gives the impression there is no human agency, that it's all just inevitable stuff. And, um, I'm sorry I didn't get to talk about, I forgot, basically just forgot to talk about birth rates and birth control, because that's a very good example of human agency. Um, often coerced um, in the world's two largest countries, India and China, uh, birth control as a practice begins with dictatorial governments, which make people do it, often in very brutal anti-human rights terms. Um, but also people pick up on it and they want to do it. And um, now they're trying to reverse it. Yeah, not having a lot of success. Your country's had a lot of trouble trying to raise birth rates. So um, there is, there clearly is human agency involved in this. Um, that's in the book too. But of course, for this particular talk, I was emphasizing the stuff. You can't. It's hard to put human agency on a graph. So I, 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 I didn't. But yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Jack. <laughs> Yeah, um, I was wondering about the relationship between the idea of like total war and technology change. So it mm -hmm. seems like you're saying that like total war is like a catalyst yeah. for all these exponential mm -hmm. growths. But it doesn't seem obvious to me what the relationship would be between like total war and agricultural productivity or cheaper energy yeah, yeah. or contraception. And so I was wondering yeah, if you could talk about right. Well, what that relationship right well there, there isn't necessarily one I, I did mention some of the examples of the things that we, we get out of total war um although what i would say if you look more broadly at the age of total war the years 1914 to 1945 these are the period in which um agri the hybrid hybridization of um, 
uh, grain crops begins. This is the period in which the first experiments with hormonal contraception begin in the 1920s. Um, so there's this really enormous, it's really, it's not just, this, it is the Second World War, but there's that whole period is one of remarkable technological progress. Um, and we sort of still, we're living off a lot of it now, although there has been from the, this is part of what makes the 19, the late millennium era, thank you, Tim Bent, um, a, um, <laughs> there are new forms of technology that develop. And I, um, I would mention in particular, um, genetic engineering, uh, material science, and, um, oh, shall I call it, um, communications, uh, networking, particularly with computers. The computers are a product of the age of total war, but computer networking is not. And um, so there, there are new things that have been happening since the 1980s, which are different um, and have a lot of future potential. Well, let's go ahead and give uh, Professor Sperber that was great. some technological progress in your um, your computer equipment here because it's really uh... absolutely let's thank Jonathan one more time. Thank you so much for